through uh, honors chemistry. We're going to start with uh, chapter one today. This will be our first discussion of the year. You know, unfortunately, we're going to do a lot of vocabulary today, which isn't the most exciting aspect of chemistry. Uh, we'll make sure that we um, demonstrate several of these concepts in class um, and also uh, via video on YouTube. So let's just get right after it today. Let's just start uh, with chapter one. Chapter one is entitled matter and of course the first thing we should probably do is define the term matter because after all chemistry by definition is the study of matter. So what is matter? Well it's a pretty doggone broad definition. Matter is anything. Now that's not the entire definition. Sorry. That has mass and takes up space. So, what would that include? Well, obviously it would include this pen, wouldn't it? This pen has mass and it obviously takes up some space. Would it also include the air that you breathe? Does air have mass? Well, let's see, we've heard of uh, balloons that are filled with uh, a gas that's lighter than air. So obviously, relative to that gas, air must have mass. And it does take up space. That balloon certainly, um, uh, when it's filled with air, expands and it takes the space. So certainly gases would be considered matter. Solids would be considered matter. A glass of water would be considered matter. Now, let's define the term mass a bit more specifically. Mass is simply a measure of the amount of matter. So if I could measure the amount of matter in this pen, that would be the mass of this pen. That would be um, usually measured in the unit gram. We would measure mass using something called a balance, which we'll be using in the laboratory very soon. Now please don't get mass confused with weight. There's a subtle difference between mass and weight, and to be quite honest, we use these two terms interchangeably without, uh, oh, without too much of a problem. So there is a difference between the two, and let me tell you what that is. Uh, weight is the force of gravity acting upon an object. So the force of gravity on an object. Let's see if I could spell a little bit better there. For instance, if there is no gravity acting upon this pen, it would have no weight. However, it would still be composed of some matter, so it would have mass. It turns out that mass, the amount of object in this pen, or the amount of matter in this pen, would be the same throughout the universe. However, its weight would be different. If I were orbiting the Earth, the weight of this pen would be different than if this pen were on the moon or in this room. Okay, Weight is the force of gravity acting upon an object. Now, we can classify matter. We like to classify things in science, you know that. And so we're going to break matter down into a couple of different categories and then we're going to break those categories down into even smaller categories. So, we can take all matter and we can break it down into substances that are pure and substances that are mixtures. Pure substances are either elements or compounds. Now in just a few minutes we're going to define the term element and compound to help you understand the difference between the two. Mixtures can either be homogeneous, sometimes pronounced homogeneous, or heterogeneous. Once again we are going to define these two terms also. And then I have some examples listed for elements, compounds, homogeneous mixtures, and heterogeneous mixtures. So let's talk about these terms next. Now, 
you're going to find the scheme very similar to the one we just looked at on page 11 of your textbook. All right. Now it says you can define these terms at home. You're probably at home right now watching this video. So let's go ahead and knock them off and we'll try to do this sort of quickly. Let's talk about homogeneous first. A homogeneous mixture is a mixture that is uniform throughout. So homogeneous is a mixture that is uniform throughout. Now, a mixture is not an element and it's not a compound. A mixture is a combination of elements or a combination of compounds or a combination of elements with compounds. If that mixture is uniform throughout, it's called homogeneous. These are also known as a solution. Now let me give you a really quick example here. If I were to take um, oxygen gas, which by the way is an element, and mix that with nitrogen gas, we would have what's called a homogeneous mixture. It would be uniform throughout. Another example might be sugar and water. If I take a teaspoon of sugar and place it in a cup of water and mix it together, that mixture is uniform throughout. And we would call that homogeneous. Heterogeneous is a mixture that is not uniform throughout. So, if I were to take, uh, let's say, a teaspoon of sand and mix that in a cup of water, no matter how much I stirred that up, that sand would not dissolve in the water. It would be in a non-uniform mixture. So sand and water would be heterogeneous. And that brings us to the term phase. A phase is simply a distinctive form of matter. Now, in chemistry, we usually talk about three phases of matter. You've heard of them all. They would be solid, liquid, and gas. Okay. All right, now a solution we've already defined. A solution is just another word for homogeneous mixture. A compound. A compound is made from the atoms of two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. Okay, it is made from um, atoms. of two or more elements chemically bonded. Let me give you an example. Um, the obvious example. We've already mentioned this. Water. Water is made from two hydrogen atoms chemically bonded to an oxygen atom. That makes a compound. Now keep in mind, if I had hydrogen gas and oxygen gas mixed together, that would be a homogeneous mixture. That would not be a compound. The key is the atoms have to be chemically bonded to each other to be considered a compound. Now an element is a pure substance made of one type of atom.
So if I have a pure substance made up of only one type of atom, I have something called an element. So if I had oxygen gas, that's only made up of oxygen atoms. If I had gold, pure gold, it's only made up of gold atoms, so that would be an element. If I had sodium metal, it's only made up of sodium atoms, so that would be an element also. And then let's go ahead and pick on another uh, non-metal. If I had helium gas, a balloon full of helium, all it would have is helium atoms, so that would be considered an element. Okay, let's talk about properties here. First talk about physical properties. A physical property is a characteristic can, that can be observed without changing the identity of a substance. Okay, so it's a characteristic that can be observed without changing the identity of the substance. So think for a minute. Can you think of a physical property of this pen? Now let's see. It looks like the cap is silver in color. So that would be a physical property. I've observed that property without changing the identity of the substance. It has blue ink. Once again, it's a characteristic that can be observed without changing the identity. I could find its mass. I could put this on a balance and find its mass. I didn't change the identity, so that would be a physical property. Now, some properties are intensive and some are extensive. Now let's talk about the difference between the two, and I believe on your homework tonight you have to differentiate between these two types of properties. An intensive property is a property that does not depend on the amount of matter. So it's a property that does not depend upon the amount of matter that's present. So for example, the let's see, um, if I said that gold had a yellowish color to it, color would be an intensive property. It doesn't make a difference if I have a small flake of gold or if I had a swimming pool full of gold. Um, let's think of another example of an intensive property. What about boiling point? At sea level, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It doesn't make a difference if I have a cup of water or once again a swimming pool full of water. It still will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. How about electrical conductivity? We all know that copper conducts electricity very, very well. Does the wire have to be really thick, or can it be a very, very fine wire? Or does it not make a difference? Since it doesn't depend upon the amount of matter present, electrical conductivity would be an intensive property. Well, guess what extensive properties are? Extensive properties are properties that do depend on the amount of matter. Can you think of a couple of extensive properties? Hmm. How about mass? Certainly mass depends upon the amount of matter that's present. How about volume? The amount of space something takes up. That certainly depends upon how much matter is present. See if you can think of a couple of other extensive properties on your own. All right, then we also talk about changes. So I want to talk about physical changes, and we'll talk about chemical changes. 
A physical change is a change in a substance. That does not change the identity. substance. So think of a couple of physical changes maybe. How can you change something but not change its identity? Hmm. Well, how about cutting? What if I took this piece of paper that I'm writing on and cut it? Would cutting it change the identity? Would, wouldn't it still be paper after I've cut it? How about if I took a piece of plastic and melted it? Wouldn't it still be plastic after I melted it? If you end up chemically with what you started with, then the change is considered to be physical. What if I took a piece of wood and I, here we go, sawed that piece of wood up into two pieces of wood? Obviously, I changed it, but it's a physical change. I still have chemically what I started with. Okay. Let's stop there for right now for the first part of this discussion, and we'll continue on with part two in just a few minutes. Stay tuned.